Okay. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, a welcome, a very uh, cold and somewhat damp welcome to the University of Oxford, also known as a normal welcome to the University of Oxford. Uh, typically, for English weather, it has been bright and sunny all the days that we have had to stay inside during the COVID-19 crisis. And today, as we've had to come out um, and uh, take you around the city, of course, uh, the heavens opened up this morning and thankfully uh, they've just stopped so hopefully at least it will be somewhat dry. So uh, my name is Eric, um, I live in Oxford, I'm a former postgraduate student of the University um, of Oxford, so um, a big truck. Um, as you can see not all economic activity in England has stopped. Um, but uh, because of the COVID-19 crisis, uh, Oxford is physically shut down, even though this is actually the first week of Trinity term and students are attending their classes virtually from their homes around the world. Um, Lindsay and I live in Oxford, my, so my, my wife Lindsay and I live in Oxford, she's the one behind the camera today, so we are allowed to not be socially distant, but everybody else is socially distant and we're taking a socially distant walk um, in the sort of hour or so that we are allowed outside every day as per the government's guidelines. Um, so I'm going to be very happy to take you around today. What we're going to do is I'm going to start you off with a little bit of um, the history of the university, the early history of the university, because it is key to understanding um, how this place works. Um, and I should say a big hello to just people from all around the world. I understand we have people from all over uh, the UK and Europe and North America and Mexico and Hong Kong and India and a lot of other places. So um, that's really um, nice that you've all uh, tuned in. Um, so a very good place to start with histories is right at the beginning with the uh, small proviso that we're not entirely 100% sure with Oxford when the beginning was. The university uses 1096 AD as the foundation date um, and that makes it the third universe, oldest university in the world. So the oldest university in the world is the al Kawahiri University in Cairo, founded in 956, and then the oldest university in Europe is the University of Bologna in Italy, which was founded four years previously to Oxford uh, in uh, 1092. Um, and then Oxford comes in at 1096, making it the oldest university in the English-speaking world. And the reason we use 1096 is because that is the earliest um, known instance of Oxford University's teaching. And it happened in the university church, which we're going to see closer to the end of our talk um, in Radcliffe Square. Um, and we know that the entire, um, everything we know about Oxford, everything that we um, that we recognize today to be fundamentally Oxford, uh, all come from uh, this um, direct line from the teaching in the church. And the reason that the teaching happened in the church is because the only people who could teach were the only people who could read and write in Europe in 1096, and they were priests, right? Not even kings and queens could read and write at this time period uh, in Northern Europe uh, William the Conqueror when he conquered Europe, uh, sorry, not Europe, England, uh, from uh, Normandy in 1066, travelled with a bunch of priests who sent messages to his generals who were also travelling with priests who could read them out to them and reply. So the church is very powerful, but it takes its position as a centre of knowledge as well very, very seriously. And so the traditions of the church have transmogrified into the traditions uh, of Oxford as well. Um, so from 1096, they requisition their church to teach, and the students come, and they don't live in grand buildings like they do today. They're lodges, they're Airbnbers, right? They live in uh, people's homes, um, and um, they're also much, much younger than today's students, right? So today's students start at 18. We're talking about 11-year-olds uh, coming to study. Why? Why 11? Well, there's two reasons. One, it's no formalized school system, so this is pretty much the start of your education, other than being taught to read and write. Um, and secondly, you know, your life expectancy is 35, so you know, you've got to, got to get moving if you're going to learn anything, be of any use. Um, the third characteristic of these students is that they really, really got on the nerves of the townspeople that they lived with. 
Why? Because they're 11 or 12, they've just left home for the first time. And because they're drunk. Why? Because everyone's drunk, right? In this day and age, everybody drinks. Everyone, everyone, everyone. Everyone drinks at least beer because it's safer than water. So pretty much the whole of history in Europe until about 1800 is made by people who are slightly buzzed, which may you know, lead to uh, more uh, palatable explanations for why some people did things uh, in thousand years of European history. Um, and eventually, um, these students started drunken rioting, they started killing people, um, and by 1210, they were thrown out of the city. And they went to another city and they founded another university, uh, and that city was Cambridge. And that's why we have 1210 as foundation date for Cambridge, what we know, what we know here in Oxford as the other place. That collapsed the city's economy, which we're learning again. If there are no students here to buy things, the economy collapses. That happened in 1210. It's sort of happening in 2020, uh, 810 years later. And so uh, uh, a delegation of merchants was sent to Cambridge to beg them to come back. Um, and they started coming back in dribs and drabs. Um, and the city was very happy uh, to, to have them back. But they also said, look, we need your money, but we hate you. So, how are, we going to, how are we going to sort this out? And that is when Oxford invented the college. So, those of you in other parts of the world, other parts of England even, use the term university and college interchangeably. It is key to understanding Oxford to understand that those two words have very separate meanings. The colleges emerged as safe places for the students to live, study and work, away from the townspeople. Essentially dorms that also had um, dining rooms and chapels and libraries. And they're still that today, 800 years later. The universe, so each college is like a US state or a German land, right? They form a federation. There's 39 of them now. They form a federation that together, along with the departments and the federal part of Oxford, become known as the university. So the university is like the federal government. They award the degrees, they set the exams, and they own each individual university. Uh, and we're going to see a mixture of university buildings and college buildings as we move through the process. So that's kind of the initial spiel. If anybody has just joined, you've just missed a basic history um, of early history of Oxford. My name is uh, Eric. Um, I'm a, a, a travel curious tour guide today. Um, please, everyone, go to www. Uh, not right now, please stay with me, uh, www.staycurious.tours for more information about Travel Curious. Um, and in order to um, donate um, any tips, which I am going to be taking and donating to the uh, National Health Service Combined Charities Fund, um, helping the key workers, and people, you know, uh, who have families that are struggling or um, may have may have died, and, and their families need support. Um, and so, very well, one more calls and any talk highly uh, would appreciate it if you would uh, donate. So, on to our first building, which is very conveniently. Uh, this one over here. This is known as the Sheldonian Theatre. So the Sheldonian Theatre is the graduate, it's the purpose-built graduation theatre um, at Oxford. Everyone who has graduated uh, from Oxford since 1669, when this building opened, has graduated in here. And it was built by a, a very famous architect, sort of Northern Europe's first real um, architect as we understand it. Uh, today, Sir Christopher Wren, um, and this building was so successful and people were so um, impressed by it, it got him his next job, and that's his most famous building, which is St Paul's Cathedral in London, with its big dome, um, it's the main city of London. Um, Americans, uh, you probably know St Paul's uh, through the uh, World War II photographs of London sort of standing undimmed in the blitz. Um, uh, and um, also, very famously, uh, held the funeral of um, Princess Diana um, and Winston Churchill and, and many other famous uh, people. So, what made this so successful? Well, um, on the inside, Christopher Wren didn't want any columns um, supporting the ceiling of his lovely curved theatre, and so he built a completely unsupported flat ceiling, uh, 70 uh, feet across, which was considered impossible at the time, and it was the largest unsupported ceiling in the world for about 250 years. And he painted it like the sky, the outer sky. So you can just imagine, you know, nobody knows how to do this, and they step out from this uh, horrible 
uh, grey sky into the Soldoni the Theatre and look up and see this beautiful blue cloudy sky and you can imagine um, how impressed uh, they all um, were. So the Soldoni the Theatre was built because graduations used to be uh, in the university church. And I'm going back the other way. So I don't know, I don't know what's going on. But um, the, the, um, the graduations used to happen in the university church. And that same problem, alcohol, rears its ugly head once again. The graduations, which today are very serious, solemn affairs, everything's in Latin, were very unserious, boisterous, drunken affairs, and they were in the church. And the priests that ran the place hated the fact that these people would get uh, very, very drunk in church. Um, and initially they tried to ban it, and I'm sure any of you who have been a student at any point understand that when you ban students from doing things, they just do it harder. This is exactly what happened, they got even drunker. So eventually they gave in and they built uh, this beautiful, beautiful building um, behind me, the Chardonian Theatre. So we're going to cross the street now, and I'm going to show you um, the only real feature we can show you up close, because obviously the gates are all closed. So I told you Christopher Wren got his next job from, uh, from this one. And in fact, he was in demand for that job so fast, he actually left without fully completing it. And the bit that he didn't complete was this outside set of gates. And he wanted some sort of nice Roman things put on it. And he left for London to, to do, um, just to begin St Paul's Cathedral. And he told his second in command, give me something Roman, and then left. And so this guy decided that he'd put some nice Roman looking heads on. And uh, this is what he came up with. Um, so as you can see, um, they're ludicrous, they're hideous. Uh, we're not even sure who or what they're meant to be, but um, they've now just become part of Oxford's uh, wallpaper. Uh, and they're just known as the heads, or as I like to call them, the silly heads. Um, so yeah, let's let's move on. We've actually got a question. Oh, um, yes. Why is it called the city of spires? Ah, the city of dreaming spires. You know, once we move on to Radcliffe Square, I think that will uh, reveal itself. But there was a poem written about Oxford where he talked that the poet talked about this city, this city of dreaming spires. And there's all sorts of spires that go up all around the city. And you see this lovely, lovely view from above of this city of just tall, tall towers and spires. And we'll see some of them as we go um, into Radcliffe Square um, a bit later on. This building in front of me here, today known as the Martins, um, which solves sort of complex environmental problems, um, was initially um, known as the Indian Institute, and this is where the British Empire sent its civil servants uh, to be trained to go run different bits of the empire, principally India, but also other parts um, of the world. And it is why the college that we're going to look at next door, Hartford, specialises in geography, because geography is as a degree in Oxford is basically um, an imperial overhang. You learn geography to learn, you know, basically the details of different parts of the world in order to be able to govern it. So it made sense for your college to be right next door uh, to the Indian Institute. And you can still see at the very, very top from the weather vane, an elephant instead of a cockerel on the spire. Does that come out on the video? Sort of, can you zoom like, no? Well, anyway, trust me, it's an elephant. <laughs> and uh, um, we're going to now go on to Hyde Street um, and we're going to talk about one of the colleges which has one of the more famous um, architectural features. And so we're going to talk about Hartford College. Uh, he wasn't socially distant. Um, so Hartford College, um, simultaneously an old and new college, it was initially founded in 1282 as Hart Hall. Um, was dissolved in 1820 and whenever a college is dissolved it's also the same reason they run out of money they went bust managed to get some more money in 1840 came back as Hartford College and um, Hartford College is also a very good example of how Oxford incorporates old into new buildings so this building here right you can see it's actually octagonal in shape it's one of my favorite rooms actually uh, in Oxford um, it's a beautiful octagonal room I studied a lot um, in it um, but what's really interesting is the reason why it's an octagon in the 1890s. But if you look very carefully here, right, 
this door and this bit of stone, right, it looks a lot older. And that is because it is, right? This bit is about 750 years old, not 130 years old. And that is because it was the entrance to an octagonal chapel. And when the time came to demolish it and replace it um, with this, um, they decided to echo that previous building by building it in the shape of an octagon. And even today, it is known as the octagon. And it is because of the octagon house, the beautiful chapel that had fallen into disrepair that stood um, uh, uh, before it. Um, and incidentally, through this window here, it's now a bit of a study room, these were Evelyn Waugh's bedrooms in Hartford College when he was a student here, the man who wrote Brideshead Revisited. So, continue further down. When we come, well, first of all, there's the Sheldonian Theatre again uh, on the side angle. You can see that it curves around, as I said. That's the Bodleian Library, which we're going to talk about later, but we're going to focus now on Hartford College on this. This is known as the Bridge of Sides. Now, it is known as the Bridge of Sides because, um, well, you may have uh, tuned into a travel tourist cure of Venice uh, either last week or the week before, um, and he talked about uh, the Bridge of Sides, and he also talked about the Rialto Bridge. And this is actually um, modeled on the, on the Rialto Bridge. It's also commonly but mistakenly known as the Bridge of Sides in Venice um, as well. And the reason the reason this bridge was built was um, it was a really good example of Oxford's traditions dictating its architectural features. So if we go back to all of those student riots that we were talking about and the reason that colleges were founded in the first place, right? They had to keep the students away from the townspeople and the townspeople away from the students so they stopped, so they stopped murdering each other. And those colleges then had curfews. You know, if you didn't get to a college by nine o'clock and they shut the doors, you had to find alternative accommodation for that night. And that tradition of curfew continued well after the security needs for that um, uh, ended. Um, in fact, they continued all the way until the sort of 40s and 50s. So here, in the 1830s, Hartford College, oh, sorry, in the 1880s, Hartford College expands over there, but its original buildings are over here. These are the buildings that were built 1740. And after curfew, they couldn't, they couldn't go between the buildings. Now, instead of relaxing curfew, they decided to build this bridge because um, it was a bit of a problem because most of the toilets were in this building. A lot of the bedrooms were in that building. And so the evenings became um, a little uncomfortable as indoor plumbing uh, became the norm. And so a really beautiful... Um, um, uh, feature that people sort of you know throw their graduation hats under um, as they graduate but made for perhaps the most mundane reason uh, possible so let's keep going and here on the right so you can see it like that so you can here on the right as we walk past this is the front entrance to the really famous uh, Bodleian Library. Uh, so the Bodleian Library has a really interesting um, uh, history. Um, it is the central library. So each college has one of its libraries. Some of the departments have libraries. But this is the central library. It's the second largest library in Britain after uh, the British Library, which is many, many times there. And here we are at the front door, unfortunately, again, closed as with um, everything else. Um, and you can hear how closed Oxford is just because my voice is, is, is bouncing off all the, all the wood and stone. Um, and so this is the third central library uh, in, in Oxford's uh, long history. The first one was started in the 1300s. Again, it was in the university church, the only building they had. Um, and in the 1440s, Duke Humphrey of Gloucester dies and these 281 books to Oxford. Um, this was considered, it's like today if somebody said they'd left 181 Ferraris, right? I mean, we're told Oxford only had 20 books in 1440. So they built their collection in one go, and they build a building that's 
still, um, but unfortunately we can't see today, um, called Jim Humphrey's Library. And uh, Jim Humphrey's Library uh, had a growth plan, had a growth plan. You can see the inside of the Harry Potter book, because that is on the inside of the Harry Potter Library, especially the, the restricted section, and the library is still in use today. But in 1555, um, that library was destroyed um, during the English Reformation. Um, because they were looking for, you know, Popish Catholic books, and they wanted to destroy them and replace them with Protestant books. But you know, the people sent to destroy the library couldn't read or write, and um, well, they destroyed all of them to be safe. And so the library falls into disrepair until the 1590s, when a man named Thomas Bodley comes into some money. And when I say come into some money, he marries a very rich widow. And according to the um, the time frame, uh, the, the laws of the time. Uh, his, her money became his money, and he used it um, to, to found um, the Bodleian Library, Thomas Bodley's Library. And so there's the question. So we've yeah. got a bit of wind making it a bit hard to hear. If we okay. can. And also, um, how many libraries does Oxford University have? Um, about 73. So, uh, so that is every single library, every single department, and every so, and, and, and so every single uh, department, there's sort of 40 departments, 30, 39 colleges, um, and then you've got the central libraries. So quite a lot, quite a lot. Um, can people hear me better now? We've got a comment, it's better, so. Good, good. I mean, the, the wind is going to, to do, what it, do what it does. Does anybody need me to repeat anything? Just gonna give it a second. Okay, so this is Radcliffe Square. This is the very, very heart um, of Oxford. And we have the Bodmin Library here on the left. And then here, this is, today, this is an extension of the Bodmin Library, but it was originally its own science library. And it's known as the Radcliffe Camera. And Oxford students call it the Rad Cam. And it was built between 1729 and, sorry, 1737 and 1749. It was opened in 1749. Um, and it's probably the most famous building uh, in Oxford. Um, I think even the promotional material for this tour um, incorporates the Rad Camp um, as, the, as the primary uh, thing. And so, yeah. Uh, question here, why is it called a camera? Camera is uh, Latin and also, uh, yeah, it's Latin for room. So the Radcliffe room, the Radcliffe reading room. Um, so as we walk around the square, which is also named after the Radcliffe camera, Radcliffe square, we're going to talk about some of the very interesting architectural features of the Radcliffe camera. The Radcliffe camera was made by um, one of the first architects trained by an architect. They were trained by Christopher Wren himself. And they loved the old man, right? It was a very tight-knit community of people, um, of, of a new subject, a new discipline. And so they incorporated a lot of features um, that pay tribute to Christopher Wren. So the first one is the dome. It's deliberately domed to reflect St. Paul's Cathedral, which also has this really big, famous dome. And you come literally in line with this, this bin. And if you look at those towers over there, and we'll talk about what those towers are in a second. If you look at those towers over there, the distance between those towers and the center of that dome is the same as the distance between the front two towers of St. Paul's Cathedral and its dome, right? Um, and the circumference of the Radcliffe camera is the same as the circumference of Stonehenge. Uh, that's a really, really random fact. Uh, and the reason for that is Christopher Wren was the first person to bother to successfully measure the circumference um, of Stonehenge. And those buildings over there were made by Nicholas Hawksmoor, also a student of Christopher Wren, and he embedded a secret but in plain sight tribute to Christopher Wren as well. If you, you literally have to come up here. If you look at those two towers and you see the tiny tower in the middle, in the negative space between the two towers, you should be able to wake out a W. 
and that W, and you, you might be able to see it, that W is a W for Ren, W-R-E-N. Now there's another reason that the Radcliffe camera is round, okay, and a much more profound reason than Stonehenge. The Bodley Library over there, if you can see, has a straight edge, it's a square. And the reason, so in the middle there's a big square, it goes around in a big square. The reason that it's a square is because um, education at that time was very religiously based, religious, you know, based on religion, on the Bible being the foundation of all truth. And that square was represented as a perfect square. And the perfect square is traditionally a representation of the Bible. And so you literally have all knowledge, all books, resting on a representation of the Bible, the source of all fundamental truth. This building, a science library built 250 years later, is round. It's round in direct opposition to the square. The round, the, the circle being the symbol of you know, infinity and mathematics and verifiable scientific truth. And that was a deliberate statement. It's also why everything else in the square is Gothic in architecture. This is Palladian. It's symmetrical, it's Italian, it's fashionable, it's new, it's scientifically difficult to recreate. These are all statements about how education is going to go forward. So in a lot of ways, the Radcliffe camera represents the beginning of the modern uh, university system. Onward. Saw Hartford College already. We have another one of the colleges over here. I'm just going to move over for a second. This is Brazenose College, which was founded in 1525. Um, very many famous alumni, including um, David Cameron, who was Prime Minister of the United Kingdom until 2016. Um, and um, we have produced at Oxford um, some 28 of the UK's Prime Ministers. Um, one US president, Bill Clinton, um, about one in seven of the current world leaders uh, in office, um, good, bad, and indifferent people, um, uh, have gone to you know, a lot of these colleges. Um, and we're also going to very quickly talk about the college that I had pointed to before, of the two towers. Uh, this is All Souls College. All Souls is very different to the other colleges. All Souls, other colleges have about, you know, 200-ish undergraduates, three, you know, 200, 300 undergraduates, 200 postgraduates, something like that. All Souls is home to eight students, right? It is by far the most exclusive educational institution in the world. There are no undergraduates, <clears throat> but if you are considered clever enough as an Oxford or Cambridge undergrad, actually now an undergrad from anywhere in the world, you can write the exams to get into All Souls. And now why would you do that? They're fiendishly difficult. You write three exams, two on subjects of your choice out of the subjects they offer you. One, which is general, which always has a sort of odd question. Um, and one year, the question, and uh, you know, if there are children in the audience, please cover their ears. But one year, the question was, does the nature of an orgy change if the participants are wearing Nazi uniforms? Uh, this caused a bit of a ruckus and there's a lot of media coverage, but I think the professors were quite amused with the idea. Um, and uh, yes, you have to uh, write a three-hour essay on that. And then until very recently, they also had a one-word essay. They'd give you a word and you had three hours to reflect upon it. And uh, so, you know, value, discuss. Um, that's the university church going off. We'll talk about that in a second. And so why would you put yourself through this process and through the interview well? If you get in, even if you're studying for, you're studying for a postgraduate degree, you immediately are grant, granted the rank of fellow, the rank of professor. Um, and you get to spend seven years in there, um, rent-free, um, with a stipend, to study whatever you want. You end up coming out with a PhD. So it's very, very prestigious uh, scholarship. So that's All Souls, currently eight postgraduates in there, and a whole bunch of professors too who do their research. Um, uh, so very, very different from all other educational institutions, not just in Oxford, not just in Cambridge, not just in the UK, but anywhere else um, in the world. And then we will come to our uh, final uh, building that we, I'm going to take you around uh, today. Um, so this is that much vaunted university 
Church. The University Church of St. Mary the Virgin. This is where the University of Oxford began almost a thousand years ago. There's been um, a, um, a uh, church on that site since Anglo-Saxon times, so for at least 1200 years or so. We have definite records of it from the 1280s. We know the teaching started there in 1296. The oldest part that exists today is over 800 years old. The tower there, up until the clock at the very top, that tower um, was completed in 1270. The spire was added in 1320. So this year is the 700th anniversary um, of the spire. It's a really beautiful piece um, of outstanding Gothic architecture. Um, and then there is a, a Baroque perpendicular Gothic side of the building um, on the other side um, as well. But this is where um, the university's congregation met. So congregation is the university's governing body. It first appears in the literature around the 1210s. Um, that is when the chancellor of the university appears and the vice chancellor of the university appears. Um, and that system that governs the, um, the university is still in place today, 800 years later. There's lots of other systems in place, but at the very centre, the federal nature of Oxford, congregation made up of all the professors of the colleges and the, um, the, the officials, like the chancellor and the vice-chancellor and the pro-vice-chancellor, that is still the body that meets today to make the main decisions for the university. And that's why things take ages to change at Oxford, right? The best joke about Oxford is, you know, how many Oxford dons, so don is a name for Oxford professor, how many Oxford dons does it take to change a light bulb? Change? <laughs> right? And so that idea that things change very slowly in Oxford is in part just due to the fact that you need such broad consensus among so many people to make any kind of major or even minor change. And so that leads to, you know, this square and a lot of other things about Oxford being broadly unchanging, um, even though it continues to do excellent work um, and excellent world-class um, academic work. Now, if you guys want, there are a couple of extra bonus things I can show you just down that alleyway there. How does everyone feel? A couple of thumbs up coming through? It's going to take a few seconds. No? All right, well, we have a few minutes. Okay, so there are some thumbs up coming through. Good. So <laughs> I, feel, I feel better about that. So some of you may be familiar with um, the Narnia Chronicles, the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. So C.S. Lewis, who wrote The Lion, the Witch, the Wardrobe, and the Narnia Chronicles, he was an Oxford professor here. Um, he was best friend of um, J.R.R. Tolkien, who's also a professor here, who's writing The Lord of the Rings at the same time. And he would go from the high street, which is over there, uh, from his bus in Headington. He'd walk through here to the Bodleian Library every day, and he picked up a few things that um, actually made their way into the story. So in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, Lucy goes through the wardrobe and comes up in a snowy land called Narnia. And the first thing she sees is a lamppost. And that's the lamppost that C.S. Lewis takes as his inspiration. And, he, and she meets, for the first, the first person she meets is a half-man, half-fawn, or a half-goat, a fawn called Mr. Tuppence. And that was inspired by this fawn right here, Mr. Tumnus. And they are all saved by a lion, Aslan. And you can see Aslan also making an appearance here in C.S. Lewis's walk. And there's lots of literary references like that all over the university. And we're going to end on the high street, because the high street's going to be uncharacteristically quiet um, as a car comes straight through. And the Baroque side of the church. And this is the last part of the church was built in the 1630s, again by Nicholas Hawksmoor. But I want to turn your attention to this tiny tree, tiny tree. This is the last thing we're going to talk about today, this tiny tree. This is an almond tree. And it replaced this enormous 
600 year old almond tree that used to come all the way across this street and it was beloved of generations and generations of students. And the year that I was a student here, that tree came down in a store. And instead of replacing it with something that looks similar, you know, say, fine, we'll just place it with another sapling almond tree. We have the time for it to grow. And I think it's a very subtle but astounding statement of confidence in the continued longevity of this place that's been here for a thousand years and will hopefully be here for another thousand. So I hope you enjoyed that short tour. Um, if you have any questions, I'm willing to, to wait uh, and, uh, and answer them. Yeah, we might just give it a second to yes. see if anyone has any questions. Just got more of a comment, someone saying, uh, those pillars look like the one in St. Peter's. Yes, because they are Solomonic pillars, right? So Solomonic pillars um, are exactly these curved pillars and they represent the wisdom of King Solomon. And so, especially at a place um, like uh, Oxford, that was considered to be uh, an appropriate thing uh, to have for the main entrance of the university church. We can go take a closer look. There, uh, very much not in the Gothic style that we saw on the other side of the church, um, but um, very much of the style of the day. And at the very top there, you might be able to see, yes, uh, the, the motto, Dominus Illuminatio Mea, which is the motto of the university, the Lord is my light, or the Lord illumines me. A couple other things I think I saw coming through there as well. Um, oh, just talking about the tree, saying, was oh, yes. that the one with the right angle? Yes, <laughs> correct. Yes. Yes. You can move away from that. Um, and a couple other things to point out while we're here, that way, the, the college uh, the college with that dome, that is the Queen's College, and then over here we have Oriel College, and over there we have Carfax Tower, and um, Carfax Tower is the very centre of Oxford, and during term time Oxford students um, are not allowed to live more than six miles from that tower, and it's the first time since the Great Plague in the 1660s, uh, sorry, since the plague, last time we had plague in the 1660s, that that rule has been relaxed. Yes. Got a few questions about which college did you go to and what did you read at Oxford? So I did my MBA, so I was a postgraduate student here, so um, at the uh, Saeed Business School, which solves world scale problems. Uh, uh, other MBAs who are watching this right now will be laughing. Um, and, uh, but genuinely does. And uh, my, my college was Pembroke College, um, which is uh, one of the middle-aged colleges of the university, founded in 1624. Um, very, very beautiful college right next to Christchurch. Uh, very much worth a visit, um, and I think the best college. Yeah. See if there are any more questions. Hello. Look, look we'll down that way. We'll, we'll just walk back to Okay. We'll give it a couple. We'll give it like a minute to see if there are any further questions, and otherwise we'll draw it to a close. Um, so, other things to 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 really talk about are the fact that you know if you look from here, um, again at the last post, um, if you see this covered in snow, I, I guarantee you, especially in the twilight with drift snow drifts coming through the square. I guarantee you, because I've seen this myself, it looks like Narnia. <laughs> and, you know, it, it really is, um, it can be a, a very magical place. I can hear organ music, I hope you can too. One of my favorite features um, living here with the bells and the organs and the choirs and the music that would come out of every door or every other door as you walk around the place and it always gives it, gives it that kind of um, magical air. Um, yeah. We've got one question from a little ways back. Is that the College of Samuel Johnson? I think talking about it, Pembroke. It is. Pembroke is, the, is, is Samuel Johnson's college. He was there for about a year and a half. Um, he always felt um, an affinity towards it. Uh, he did have to leave after a year and a half because he ran out of money. Um, he wasn't sort of the best student while he was there. But while he was there, the college's chapel was built. And so he had a, a hand in that and saw that coming that coming up. Yeah. And we've got a one comment um, from someone who went to Brazenose. On the left is a passageway leading to a side door into Brazenose Chapel. And that door comes out in a cupboard in the chapel. Yes, it does. <laughs> um, a friend of mine, um, Joe Dennis, if you're watching, 
uh, has definitely shown me this, who loves his college. Um, and uh, with Brazenose Chapel in particular, um, absolutely exceptional chapel, it has the best ceiling in any chapel uh, in the university. Perhaps we can do uh, another one of these once the college is reopened. I can show you uh, what some of these colleges are like on the inside because you see, they all look like imposing stone buildings on the outside and they're all sort of airy gardens on the inside. And that's just something that you don't know unless you go in. Because, you know, these things were meant to be self-contained communities. They had to be pleasant places to live. And so you have lovely gardens. Um, for example, um, Merton College has the most beautiful, beautiful gardens on the inside. And you never guess from the outside. So, uh, yeah. Um, another question coming in. Who is your favorite uh, alumni from history? God, who went to Oxford? Ah, that's a really good question. Um, ooh, well... Um, a guy who came here and studied and learned here for a little while in the 16th century was a guy called Desiderius Erasmus and he was a Christian humanist and had some really interesting theories about uh, religion and about education and about knowledge that continue to this day. So if anybody has heard of the Erasmus program of university exchanges, um, that is named after him because he traveled all around Europe you know, spreading knowledge and this idea of knowledge and religion and science being sort of something that you could incorporate uh, together. Um, so, yes, I mean, I've got so many people. Jonathan Swift went here, he was at Hartford College. Um, very, very famous uh, modern um, journalists, um, obviously politicians. Um, and uh, I've got some sort of politicians that, that I think that um, are great that have, that have gone here. Um, so yeah, I think this oh, our favorite Oxford alumni is really difficult, but I guess because Desiderius Erasmus came to my head first, maybe Desiderius Erasmus. And we've got one more question. Yeah. Um, did students in the Middle Ages have to wear their hair like monks, bald, in other words? Um, yeah, because they were training to be priests. So even into, even into the 1660s, 45% of people uh, coming out of Oxford were, uh, had been, uh, were training to be priests. Um, in fact, in the uh, 17th and 18th centuries particularly, Oxford actually went through a period of decline because it was considered too focused on becoming priests. And so yeah, initially, the students would have lived like monks, right? So those colleges, and so would have had tonsured heads. Those colleges are closed like squares, right? And that reminds you of monasteries because these things were designed by priests. And they had to, um, they, had, they, they based it on, on just what they knew. And what they knew was closed, quiet monasteries. And so even today, I mean, it's obviously a bit quieter on the outside than it normally is. But, you know, you walk out of the hustle and bustle of Oxford and you walk through, you know, uh, this passageway into this quad and suddenly everything is very hushed and very silent. And that's very much the idea. And it's very much passed directly down to us um, um, from, through 800 years of uh, tradition. Good. I think, uh, I think that clears up all the questions. Um, thank you very much indeed. Um, it's been really nice. Unfortunately, I can't see any of your faces or anything. It's, it's, it's um, very odd to just look into a camera, but thank you very much indeed. Now, please remember um, to go to www.staycurious.tours and you can see that on the pinned comment. Uh, at the bottom. Um, please, if you, if you can, we very much appreciate it if you, if you use the tip system to make a tip because it will be a donation going to the NHS Combined Charities uh, Appeal. Um, it's raised millions of pounds so far, uh, every penny needed right now uh, as um, Britain, along with so many other countries in the world, goes through uh, this period um, of social distancing and, 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 and COVID-19. Um, so thank you very much once again. Um, Stay curious, um, and uh, I hope uh, to maybe show you around uh, some other time. Thank you very much. And you can save the thing.